So this is the title we're going to do a tutorial on. Um, to be honest, it's less a tutorial because I don't expect you all to do this title, but more a sort of insight into different things that you can do in Fusion that have culminated in this title. Uh, hope you enjoy it. Cheers. Just so you know what we're working on, uh, this is my specs. Uh, it's not a powerful computer at all, but it does the job. Also, just to let you know that I use a reactor fuse called wireless link quite a lot in this tutorial you don't need wireless link but it does help me keep my node tree tidy um, i'll leave a link in the description to where you can download reactor and instructions for installing it so let's get into it we'll open up our davinci resolve and the first thing I do is look at my timeline settings. I've got it set to 1080p at 24 frames a second, but depending on your computer setup, you may need to change this either to a lower resolution or if you're lucky and have a nice beefy computer, you can always up it to 4K or something. So once the timeline is set up, we're going to bring a fusion composition into the timeline and adjust its length as needed for this example I use 10 seconds once that's done we will jump into fusion so now we're in fusion I'm just going to move the media out node out of the way and the first thing we're going to need is a 3d text node which is available from the bar here Enter in whatever text you want your title to be made up of. And then we can drag the node into the viewer window, reposition it and get a look at what our text is saying. Now in the example I showed at the beginning, the hot word is in red, which in 2D mode would be done in character level shading. However, that doesn't work in 3D. So the workaround for this would basically be to bring in a 2D text node, which I'll do in just a second. Now we can use this 2D text node to set up the character level shading. I don't know if you need to input text here or not, I just did. So we'll go into the text field, select character level shading, and then in the view window, we select, drag and select, sorry, click the modifier tab. In the view window, drag and select the word hot. Any changes you make now affect just those characters. Once we've got this loosely set up, drag this 2D text node out of the way somewhere, you don't need it anymore. Go back to your 3D text node, right click, don't select character level shading, but go down instead to connect to character level shading and style text. And that brings the character level styling or shading information over. It also seems to unlock all the other character level styling settings. Don't know why, but there you go. So change the font, use whatever font you want for this. I used Futura. I brought the line spacing down and took the tracking out a little bit. Next, we are going to look at turning this into 3D text by extruding it. So come down, open the extrude options. Uh, these are just settings that I tend to use. They work quite well. So 0 0.1 for the extrude depth and 0 .01, 0 0.01 for both bevel depths. And it gives you quite a nice 3D text. Just turn on the lights so that you can actually see the effect of it. And that 
is pretty much your base text. Okay, so we've got our text in place. Now we're going to set up the rest of the 3D scene. To do this, you need common elements. Uh, you need a 3D merge, a camera, and a light. You then need to pipe all those into a 3D render node or a render 3D node. This converts your 3D scene into 2D, which can then be used in your edit tab. So hook everything into the 3D merge or merge 3D and pipe your merge 3D into your render 3D. I'm just going to close stuff down so I've got a bit more room because I need two windows here. So I'm going to put the 3D scene, sorry I'm going to put the render into viewer 2 and the 3D scene into viewer 1. As you can see at the minute there appears to be nothing in the render screen. This is because the camera is sat on the text so it's not actually seeing it. If you select the camera and then in the 3D scene drag it back you'll start to see the text appears. So move your camera around and adjust it to a position where you've got a view of the text that you're happy with. What I do is I set a target point for the camera. So go into the control of the transform tab and highlight use target. You can then adjust to where this target is. Basically this forces the camera to always look at this point regardless of where you put the camera. This will become useful in a little while when we start to animate things. So a little bit of tweaking around just to get the view that I want. Again this is all personal preference, you can stick the camera where you want it but this is just setting it up so that it replicates the, the video that we saw at the beginning. We'll now turn on the lights for the renderer. Again, the text goes dark. This is not because there is no light, but because the light source, i.e. the spotlight, is on top of or with the text, so it's not able to hit any of the surfaces. So much as we did with the camera, we now adjust the spotlight to get the desired lighting that we want. Again, using this transform screen, I will set a target for the light. So again, regardless of where the light is put, it will always shine towards this particular spot. Coming into the control tab, we can change the color of the light. To whatever you want, we can change the intensity of the light to where we need it. We can also adjust the angle of the, the cone angle of the light to give a larger or smaller light beam. And we can use the penumbra cone to give a more gradual and natural looking fall off. Okay, so we've got the text set up. We will now have a look at getting some movement into the scene. To do that, we need to animate the camera and later on we'll animate the spotlight as well. So this is where you want your animation to end. And I chose to do this at frame 120. You can choose to do it where you want. So play it to frame 120, right click where it says transition and select animate transmission transition group this sets keyframes for all three x y and z 
positions. We'll now bring the playhead back to the start, to frame zero, and we'll drag the camera around to where you want your animation to start. So just moving it over. The points I'm choosing here are purely arbitrary. You can make your animation as simple or as complex as you want. I use five keyframes one second apart just to give some movement. You can have a keyframe at the start or a keyframe at the and a keyframe at the end and just to sort of pan the camera. Or you can have more keyframes and make your animation more complex. So having set the first keyframe you'll see that Resolve automatically highlights your keyframes for you and we now move forward to frame 24 i.e. one second forward and reposition to where you want your second waypoint if you like of your animation to be you basically repeat this step until you've got all your keyframes in place eventually your camera will return to your end position at frame 120 Resolve will automatically set keyframes at each point if you press control and drag along the timeline it will limit the render range temporarily just so that you're only rendering the bit you want to check So we now have our rough animation, it's a bit robotic so we're going to use the spline editor to smooth out the curve. So click the three dots, select show only, selected and that will just bring up your camera node. Check your camera so that you can see your spline and your waypoints. This little box zooms everything to fit. Here we see all the waypoints for the X, Y and Z axes. Drag select them all, click shift S and that just smooths out all your curves and if you look in your 3D view your path is now curves rather than straight lines. Again not necessary but it just makes the, the sort of animation run a bit smoother. Okay, so we've got the camera animated, we're now going to turn our attention to the spotlight. The process is exactly the same, so set your last keyframe to where you want your animation to end, in this case frame 120. Go to transition, right click the transition label and animate the transition group. This sets your last keyframe. You'll then bring your playhead start i.e. frame zero and start to move your light around again as you're moving the light to different positions you'll notice that resolve automatically sets keyframes for you again much with, as with the camera I used five keyframes and eventually brought the light back to key for, to frame 120 this gives you animation for your light. Again, the animation is a little bit robotic, not very smooth, so we're going to use the spline editor. Make sure the spotlight is selected, zoom to fit to get all your key points, drag select and shift S to smooth the curves. And again, your light path is now curved rather than linear. So now we've come to the bit where we need to 
look at the text that we have and we know that we want the flame to come out from the eye so we need to hide the dot basically I don't know how to mask in 3D I don't know if you can mask in 3D so I kind of came up with my own solution which involved encasing the dot in a 3D shape and then making that 3D shape into a mat. So drag in a 3D shape. In this case the dot is effectively a cylinder. So we will change our 3D shape to cylinder. Pipe it in to the 3D scene. We now need to manipulate this so that it's the same size and orientation as the dot. At the minute the caps of the cylinder are off this is what they look like on i will leave them off for now because it just makes life a bit easier you can see what you're doing a bit better but when we come to the stage that we're actually hiding the dot then we'll turn the caps back on so as i say resize and reposition using the trans transition tab of the shape we need to get the cylinder so that it's just slightly bigger than the dot just to make sure that we're encasing it you can use a combination of your 2D and 3D views to help you position it. In this instance I actually zoomed in on the 3D view. I think it may actually have been easier to use the 2D view but I mean, try each, whichever works best for you. So again you're trying to align it as near as possible to the dot. Drag the size down a little bit. You also need to look at and consider the length of the cylinder or the depth as it is in this orientation so that it sits slightly proud of the dot so that we can put the caps on and hide it. So as you see if we just pull it forward a little bit I unlocked the sizes here and it turns out that when you do that your Y and Z sizes aren't actually locked they just manually enter whatever value you've got in X into Y and Z and it'll bring it back into scale We have our shell around the dot, just making some final little tweaks. Come back into the main controls and you can turn your cap on.
Next we open the mat and check is mat and your dot disappears. We can come back into the transformation and just sort of fine tune. What you need to make sure of is that you don't have any little pieces of your dot showing. So if you swing around in your 3D view you can see here that there's just a slight edge. So we need to tweak the size in just to get rid of that. Now this is very much a sort of rough and ready solution to the problem. As I say, there may well be a more elegant way of doing it. I just don't know what it is. The drawback to this method is that the mat affects everything that's attached to this 3D merge node. So if you see here the letter I itself is starting to disappear. If we turn endways, it starts to impact on the letter S. If we put in smoke etc via this particular 3D scene, it will affect the smoke as well, which is why we've ended up with several render paths to make up the scene. In this instance, we're not going beyond face on with the text so we can kind of get away with it. The final thing we need to do to the text is set it up so that the dot is visible at the start of the video and will disappear at the point that the flame comes up from the eye. So we set a keyframe at frame 120 and the 3D shape we go into the visibility tab of the controls and we keyframe the visibility. We now go back one frame, uncheck visibility which sets the keyframe and that's basically it. As we hit frame 119 dot is still visible and as we hit frame 120 the dot will disappear. And that's your text set up and animated to work as we need it to. Now we're going to move on to the second render path, uh, which will be the steam effect. The first thing we're going to need for the steam effect is a fast noise node. If we look at the fast noise in the viewer, we then need to look at setting it up. The first thing we're going to do is change its size, so uncheck auto resolution, and in the width and height boxes, set width and height to 500. Next, we're going to look at the change in this style to gradient and we will change it to radial. We're going to put the start position of the radial gradient in the centre, so that will be 0.5 and 0.5. The end of the gradient we will move around manually. You basically need the gradient big enough you get an effect but you need to make sure that it stays within the bounds of your square. You'll set the first gradient point to white and the end gradient point to black and set your alpha channel to zero. This will be basically your smoke particles. The next thing you need to do is have different particles on each frame. So you will come and set a seethe rate so that the image changes 
for each frame. And once you're animating your fast noise, you can make adjustments. Uh, you'll notice here I'm putting the detail up, tweaking with the contrast and the brightness. And if you watch closely, you'll see that the animation actually goes beyond the edges of the box. So again, we just need to tweak the end of your gradient and bring it in slightly. Next, I'm adding a brightness and contrast node, and I will add a rectangular mask to this brightness and contrast node. Basically, what we're trying to do is give an impression of depth. So if you bring your mask, bring it into your brightness and contrast node, and adjust its size so that you're taking up roughly half of your image. Uh, and just see me sort of changing the size and repositioning. So bring it down to about halfway. I tilted it slightly. And then you bring up the soft edge on the mask. You can go back at this point and tweak the brightness contrast until the bottom half of your particle is noticeably darker than the top half and you start to get a sense of depth so now we've got the fast noise set up we need to start setting up our particle system so we'll bring in a particle emitter and a particle renderer these are the basic building blocks for your particle system we'll link them together and what we need to do is bring the fast noise into the particle emitter, but at the minute there is no input for it. So in the style tab of the partic particle emitter, we will change the style to bitmap. This allows us to now connect the fast noise to the particle emitter. With the fast noise and the particle emitter set up and attached to the particle render, we can now drag the render into the view window and see the start of our steam system. On the first look, it's not massively impressive, but as we work through, it will become more realistic. For now, we're going to temporarily feed particle system into our main text merge 3d we're doing this so that we can position it into the 3d scene where we want it as you can see at the minute it sits in the middle at the bottom if we swivel the image round you'll see that the emitter is actually sat inside the text we don't want this we want the particles behind the text. So we'll drag and reposition the emitter so that it sits behind the text. We're now going to change the region style to cube and we're going to change the size of this cube so that the emitter runs along the back of the word hot. So it's simply a case of stretching out the cube. If you pull the slider to its maximum, it's slightly short, so you'll need to type a figure into the box. In this case, I think I used two, and then just shrink it back down so that it fits. So we now have our emitter sat on the ground behind the word hot the steam will come up behind the word. Still in the particle emitter, we're now going to go into the control settings and we're going to start playing with some of the settings here. The first thing we'll play with is the velocity. 
will give it a velocity of 0.1 as we play you'll see that the particles go off to the right obviously this isn't what we want what we want is for the particles to be going up so we will change the angle here to 90 and that sends our particles up We can also add some variance to the angle. Uh, I think I settled on 40 in the end. It just sort of fans the particles out a little bit. Again, you can put whatever figure you want in here to suit your particular project. And now we can see the steam coming up at the back of the lettering. At this point it's worth just sort of checking your positioning and in this case I'm going to drag it back a little bit more just so that it's a bit further back from the text and there you have the start of your steam system we'll now disconnect it from the text scene and we'll start to work on it in isolation so our steam at the minute has way too many particles and they're too small so we'll start by dropping the number of particles produced down to one next we'll go to the style tab open the size control and we will crank the size control up so that we're getting much larger particles as you can see at the minute they're all kind of overlapping and look horrible to solve this problem we come down to the animate drop down menu and pick particle birth time so now we're getting much more steam like look the problem at the minute is the particles are popping in and out so if we come down to the fade control put a value of 0.25 in the inbox and 0.75 in the outbox you get a much more natural looking steam system coming back to the controls we can add some variance to the velocity I used a value of 0.1 we can add some variance to the number of particles produced and now we've got a much more natural and realistic looking steam the next thing we're going to do is to just add a bit more um, activity if you like to the steam by introducing some turbulence We'll do this using another particle node called P turbulence node. So shift space and search for P turbulence. Pop this in between your P emitter and your P renderer. And with the P turbulence node selected, you can adjust the strength of the turbulence. Again, desire really so I did in some X turbulence and a tiny bit of Y turbulence but be careful with this because if you add in too much Y turbulence the steam will start to go down and we don't really want that happening okay so now we've got our basic steam system set up I'm just going to tidy things up a little bit here And then we will start to make the render path for the steam. Now we're going to want the steam to be viewed and lit the same as the text. So we will need to share the camera and the spotlight. If 
from the tax system with our steam system. In order to enable this we need to set up a 3D merge for the steam system which will have its own 3D renderer. There are a couple of ways we can do this. The first way would be to drag from the output of the camera and the light and link them in to the Steam's Merge 3D node. This system is adequate and works perfectly well. However, we will be having another two render paths and if all those render paths are directly linked it's going to start getting very confusing and very untidy which personally I don't like so the way around this is to use a wireless link as described at the beginning of this sort of session which is available through reactor I'm going to assume at this point you've installed the wireless link. So the first thing we need to do is get our wireless link. So shift space and search wireless. You've got several options here. We're looking for the 3D wireless link. So select it and bring it into your tree. It sits independently at the moment and it doesn't know what it's doing. This dialog box is empty so we need to tell it what it's supposed to be. The way you do that is you take the node that you want it to be and simply drag it into the dialog box. So this wireless node is now a camera and it will mimic the camera from the text node tree. Just to avoid confusion I'm going to label these as we go along. So F2 to bring up the label dialog box. We can now drag this down to our Steam render path and connect it into the Merge 3D node. We'll now do the same for the Spotlight. So get another wireless 3D link. And again, we need to tell it where it's supposed to be. In this case, it's the spotlight. So we will take the spotlight node and drag it to the dialog box. So this wireless link is now this spotlight and we'll label it as such. F2 to open the relabeled dialog box. And again, connect it to your Steam's Merge 3D node. So we will go into the Merge Steam, Steam 3D's render and turn on the lights. Your Steam is now being lit and viewed exactly the same way as your text. If we drag it into the viewer, you'll see what the camera is seeing. Steam system, because it's particle based, is quite intensive and slow, as you can see. Once the render gets to the end of the clip, it will start again, and you'll see now that our smoke is animated and illuminated in exactly the same way as your text was when we animated and lit that. Again, it's slow, uh, it will eventually render through and we should be able to see the smoke in real time but it's not going to happen so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on proxy mode from the playback menu I've chosen a quarter size proxy it reduces the quality of your image a little bit but as this is only for testing and viewing purposes it doesn't matter as you can see the smoke now runs a little bit faster So again you can see the animation and illumination effect running a bit more smoothly now.
Okay, so that's your first steam system set up. So we'll group these nodes together. And I will rename them so that we don't get confused later on. So this now becomes our second render path. So we have our back steam and we have our text. If we quickly merge our text on top of our steam, we can start to get an idea of what the finished product will look like. Again, the text and the steam are animated, are lit and sort of viewed from the same point, so they sort of stay together in the animation. Okay, so I've got a basic animation set up. What I don't like is the fact that the steam is around during the animation. What I want is for the steam to appear as the animation comes to an end. So the steam's here, I don't like it. So I'm going to bring my playhead to frame 120. I'm going to temporarily open this group and in the P emitter node, I'm going to keyframe the number and the number variance at frame 120. I'll then jump back one frame and I will drop numbers to zero and variance to zero. What this will do is stop the smoke appearing until the animation comes to a static position. So at frame 19 you have your text, at frame 120 you lose your dot and your steam starts. So we've closed the steam group down and we're now going to think about the steam for the front of the text. Basically all we're going to do is copy the back steam and make some changes to it. So I'll just get rid of this merge node, we don't need it at the minute. We're going to do control C or command C, control or command V and we make a copy of the steam system. We're going to use F2 and rename this so that we know it's the front steam. And we'll make some alterations to this. So we open the group up. The first thing we need to do is reattach our cameras because unfortunately when you copy the wireless link it doesn't copy what it's supposed to be. So click your camera wireless link and from the text render path just drag your camera back in and the same for the spotlight. Once we've done that we can look at our steam in the viewer and you'll see it is exactly the same as our background steam. It's the same shape, size, rate and position. So we'll come into the P-emitter node and we'll start changing some of its values. Make sure your playhead is at 120 because that's where your keyframe was. I basically just halved most of the values. Um, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, and then a lifespan of 50. So now if we look, we have a much smaller steam plume. What I also did, if you see, is I will 
you see this, that you've got a different pattern. And that is basically your front steam. What we need to look at doing now is getting it in the right position. To do that, I'm going to ungroup it and temporarily disconnect the P renderer and pipe it into the text render path so that we can see, as I say, it's in the same position as our back text. So what we need to do is bring it forward. You can either drag it on the screen or you can do as I'm doing here and use the sliders. So go to the regions tab and the Z offset and just move it to the position that you want your front steam to sit in. If we now look as the animation plays through because it's already keyframed from the back steam as we hit frame 120, the steam starts to appear in front of the writing. Again, you can change the values to get the desired effect. I was quite happy with this. It obscures the text to start with, but then fades out a bit, so you can still read it. So disconnect your emitter from the text path and reconnect it to its own render path. and regroup it. Rename it so that you don't get confused. F2 to open your rename. And there is your third of four render paths. So we now have our text, our front and back steam. Our fourth render path will be the flame that appears above the eye. Now I must confess that I've kind of cheated here. I've copied the system from an earlier version purely because setting up the particle emitter was a bit of a pain in the bum. The system is the same system that we used for the steam. We have a fast noise which drives the whole system. Same settings, 500 by 500, white to transparent gradient. Again, making sure that it sits within the square. The node here labeled fire is the P emitter. For the sake of clarity, I'll rename it P emitter fire just because I'm going to regroup these and I will call the group fire and it'll only let you use a label once. So in the P emitter you can see the settings I used for the fire at the minute they're off because again it's keyframed to turn on at frame 120. So if you come beyond frame 120 you can see Uh, now you can't see because it's got a wireless link and I copied it and forgot to relink the camera. So again, click on the wireless link, drag the camera into the dialog box and now we can see what we're doing. So just bring the flame forward so you can see it. So in the P emitter you can see the settings I used, 50 number 37 lifespan, 0.22 and 0 0.004 for your velocity and variance. I also added in a bit of Z angle just to, in theory, it brings it in and out of the screen a little bit. Uh, again, set your animate to particle birth time, size to 0.1, some variance to the size. I also, if you notice in the little graph, that I've brought the size down over time. Left is the start and right is the end. I've also added in the fade. Your region is a sphere of about 0.1. And 
that is basically your flame. Whilst we copied the camera, we didn't need to copy the light because it has its own spotlight. What I'm going to do now is temporarily pipe the system into the tech system just for positioning really. Now it's already positioned because as I say I copied it from an earlier version. However, if you do need to reposition it, we would come into the style tab and use the transition X, Y and Z offsets to bring it to the position that you want it to be in. If you notice, it has a circle missing at the bottom. This is the mat that we use to hide the dot. As I said earlier, anything that's piped into the text to merge 3D node is affected by this mat, which is why we have the separate render nodes, or render systems, should I say. So disconnect it from the text and reconnect its camera and its own 3D render node and we have our fourth render path so let's tidy up this flame we're going to regroup it so command or control G to group things F2 to rename them and we'll rename this fire and we'll pop it down with our other render paths. So we now have our text, our rear smoke, our front smoke and our fire. So we've got all the elements that make up the title display. I'll now group off the text and the animation And the next thing we need to think about is merging them all together. So the order that you arrange things in doesn't matter. Uh, Resolve Fusion isn't layer based, but there are some conventions that we need to follow. So I'm just going to layer these in the sense that whatever's at the top is at the front of our view and whatever's at the bottom will be at the back of our view. We're now going to merge one on top of the other. So you can take the output of one render node and drop it onto the output of the next and it creates a merge automatically. The first node you pick will be in front of whatever you drop it onto. So the front smoke is on top of the text, so is in front of the text. If we then take the output from this merge and drop it onto the fire, the text is technically on top of the fire and then the fire and everything else is on top of the background smoke. If you happen to get it the wrong, wrong way round, if you highlight a merge node and press Ctrl or Command T, it will flip the inputs so the background becomes foreground and vice versa. Control T to flip it back again. So this should now be our finished title. It's chugging along so what I'm going to do is drop my proxy down to quarter which will hopefully speed things up a bit and we can see the whole animation in action. So the text comes in and then at frame 120 it will sit still, the dot will disappear, the smoke will start and your fire starts.
now you'll get a sense in pretty much real time of what the effect looks like. Now, if you wish, to all intents and purposes, this is the finished title. You can subscribe, give me a thumbs up and all that kind of stuff, and be on your merry way, and thank you for sticking with me for the guts of an hour. However, I don't know if you noticed in the original video, there is some extra lighting that I threw in. Uh, it's simply putting a couple of spotlights in and positioning them. There's no animation involved. Uh, I'm very quickly whizzing through it here. Um, I turned off the main spotlight just so I could see the effects of the secondary spotlight. Um, I changed the colour, changed the position, etc. and did the same for the next spotlight, again turning off the first extra spotlight so we can see what's going on. You can turn nodes on and off by pressing Command or Control P. So once you've got your secondary spotlights in, turn everything back on and you've got a nice pretty colour on your text. Purely optional. What I also did was I used wireless links to copy one each of these spotlights to the front and rear smoke. So wireless link in, drag your light to let your wireless link know what it's doing. And then the same for the other smoke. If this is always a bit fast, if you go to the, the sort of top of your YouTube thing, you've got the option to slow it down, slow the playback down. And there we have the finished product. Thanks for sticking with it. I hope it was useful. Um, leave some feedback below. Bear in mind this is my first tutorial, so be kind. Thanks a lot.